Indeed, we rejoice that God has sent his son. And we're turning in Luke, we're, we're uh, having a pause from our series in Luke and, and, Gener- and Genesis to, to look at the different gospel uh, messages in John concerning the coming of Christ. And we're looking at John 3 now today. Turn with me in God's word. You can find it on page 940 in your pew Bibles. And uh, uh, we're looking at the words from John. I'll speak about them in a little bit. Christ has just got done talking to Nicodemus and, and even pointing to himself, saying, uh, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man may be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then we're turning to verse 16 through verse 21. And let us stand and, as we read God's word in this very well-known passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Lord. Of God, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Please be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, I thought we'd look at this verse because really it's the simplest retelling of the Christmas story in God's word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Many of us have learned this verse on our mother's knees or maybe our grandmother's knees. We've seen the reference, John 3, 16, held up at sporting events. And all different types of places. But sadly, too, this is a passage that, that frankly, is maybe sometimes so misrepresented, so misunderstood. And, and it's a passage where the truth familiarity can breed contempt or even boredom. It is so true because we can miss the shocking nature of the gift of God's love to sinners like us. This is a gift God's salvation. In a couple of days, unless you're getting something like a nose hair trimmer, we will give and receive many gifts that are expressions of, of love. As my grandma Schnabel was dying of cancer, she made sure all of her Christmas gifts were purchased, including her trademark gift of linen dish towels. Who knew that the side of a dish towel would cause a bit of ache in the heart for a reason other than having to do dishes? Gifts can be precious to us. But what God gives is no simple gift. To imagine this idea that we live in this world to err as human and to forgive as divine is blasphemy. It cheapens God's love because God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And none of us deserve it. And this well-known passage of John 3.16 reveals this shocking gift of God's love God's own son. That's what it took for your and my salvation. This undeserved gift of eternal worth then also is one that is received by faith only. Sometimes things that are right before us later we, we learn are pretty shocking. In the play Henry V by Shakespeare, Uh, Before a great battle in France, King Henry V shockingly visited his troops in disguise. And and one of the soldiers that Shakespeare kind of goes through, John Bates, said he didn't think the king cared about the cost the battle was going to have on the poor soldiers. He thought the king would be rather be up to his neck in the Thames, or or swimming really is the idea in the Thames, than leading his troop into battle. King Henry, still in disguise, replied, by my troth, or by the truth, I will speak my conscience of the king 
I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. And the joy and the wonder, though, of Christ's birth is that the King of the kings and the Lord of lords, the creator, out of undeserved love, came incognito, set aside his glory in the incarnation, taking on flesh to be Emmanuel, God with us in our need. And he didn't want to be anywhere else. He knew that's what salvation required. He had to bear the judgment of God against sin for sinners like me and sinners like you. A triune God gave of himself, his son, the second person of the Trinity, to enter the fray of this fallen world. And we've heard that so many times that it really should be shocking. It would have been to the Jews of John's day. And that's why the shocking gift God gives sinners is his son. I don't know, I know the Pew Bibles don't have this, but if you look at many Bibles in, at home or the ones maybe you brought with us, there's oftentimes this section will be in red as if it's Jesus' words. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> the, the red letters are not inspired. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean it that way. I've got to be careful how I say that. The red, the color red is not inspired. <laughs> the words are inspired. It's the editors that made them red. Jesus himself, this is, we, we should understand right before this, Jesus speaks of himself as a son of man, and that's, that's how Jesus always refers to himself, and, uh, and he did that to Nicodemus, and he always refers to God in, in the most intimate of ways uh, as, as Father. And, and so we're to understand this verse, uh, verse 16 up to verse 21, really is, is John's commentary, and it follows his style in the Greek as well. And by the operation of the Holy Spirit, that we have something being revealed about our triune God that you and I would not know otherwise. We wouldn't learn it from nature. Indeed, nature points out the glory of God, but, but man suppresses the truth. And these words come in between Jesus' teaching Nicodemus that we have to be born again to be saved. We're not saved because of a religious right or, or family or co the country we're born into. And then after this, if you look a little further, we're going to have something that, that, that's striking because Jesus will save not a Jew, but a Gentile Samaritan woman. And the reason for this salvation, the reason for Jesus' birth and his saving work is laid out here. It's being told to us that it's not limited to a certain people like the Jews, and it's not limited even to a certain time otherwise we would be without hope. But John lays before us this love of God for a world of sinners who do not deserve love, who are unlovely. And that's shocking. We know how we respond to sin, don't we? I mean, we, we get angry at some sinful injustice or some sin in someone else. And yet we forget God is just, perfectly pure, absolutely holy. And this is the Lord God Almighty whom, whom the heavens of heavens can't contain, before whom even this planet and even the nations are but a, but a drop on the bucket or a speck of dust on the scale. We're not going to move the Lord to do anything. This is the God whose ways are not like our ways. And we can't think like the world. We need to think God's thoughts after him. Psalm 711 says... God is a just judge. And he sweeps in under the carpet? No. And God is angry with the wicked every day. Let that sink in. Because the Bible tells us whatever is not of faith is sin. How much did we do last week, this past week, without even a thought of God, without faith? 
No wonder Romans 3 tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who does good. And having grown up in in the influence of the self-esteem movement and and being told to look in a mirror and over and over and say, there's only one you. Many think, well, of course God loves me. No. God sent his son because whether we come to faith so early we can't remember it or, or God stops us in our tracks as he did with Paul, apart from Christ, we are all perishing. God made us in his image, but that, that image is fractured. I mean, you take, take a ball pin hammer to a, a mirror, and what's going to happen? That's what sin did uh, to, to us. The sin of Adam. Even our own sins. And we were perishing. Have you noticed that? I mean, that, that's, that's the verse everybody kind of glides over in John 3, 16. Have you noticed that word perish? You And I, apart from Christ, deserve hell. And yet God does something. Romans 5.8 says it this way. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. I know we want to think God God saw something in us, but what he saw is what Genesis 6.5 tells us, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And sometimes we have a glimpse, glimpse of that. We re- realize that. Because what's the thought sometimes that can come across our minds? Maybe it was even this past week. Do you ever think, I never seem to get it right? That thought comes across my mind. And when we think of that, it's just reminding us what God knows. Our sin is not a shock to them. And that's why he did what needed to be done in his loving grace. And God the Son was sent to die in our place and atone for our sins. It's all because our triune God's gracious, loving choice. His plan of what the Bible calls election. To love you and I (laughs) despite us to change us. Not just to forgive us and let us go, but to change us and transform us so that we would follow him more and more. And and see, this this bad news that that the world is perishing makes his love shockingly deep and, and beyond measure. And see, we need to understand this and think of this often, to think of what sin really is. And think of sin maybe this way couple of days. I know many are, are scurrying around and planning and, and working hard for Christmas dinner. Well, what if the, the cook comes in on, on your Christmas dinner and says, I've put one tablespoon, just one tablespoon of poison in the ham? Would you eat it? Just one tablespoon. Maybe some rat poisoning, just one tablespoon of rat poisoning or whatever it may be. One tablespoon of hemlock. Would you eat it? I know my answer. If they said, I soaked the ham in poison, would your reaction be any different? (laughs) I'm not eating that. The answer is still the same. So whether we feel ourselves to be the chief of sinners or little sinners, we need to see the things as God does. For sin before a holy God is more offensive than the idea of poison to us. Now, admittedly, some of us do eat lye-soaked lutefisk and celebrate it. But it kind of displays what our world does, doesn't it? Celebrates sin. And the only hope is that God interrupts, that God does something. God chose to intervene and save many 
And the only way possible, the catechism talks about it this way, it says God wills, it says how do we, we get in a good relationship, and I'm paraphrasing, but how do we get in a good relationship with God? And the catechism then explains, God wills that his justice be satisfied, therefore we must make full satisfaction to that justice, either by ourselves or by another. Do you want to pay for the debt of your sin? Or do we want Christ to? God in his undeserved loving grace gave his son to save us. That brings us to the next question. To whom is this shocking gift of love given? Jesus, as God the Son, in his incarnation, joined himself eternally to humanity, and yet he was without sin. But in the flesh, he, he, in his humanity, he bears our frailty, our weakness, our dependence, our vulnerability, our weariness, our sorrow and pain in this fallen world. And he did this to save Everyone except perhaps the worst of the worst? That's what some think. They, they, I, I mean, I've had people yell at me, no, it says world. But we often use the, world, the word world to mean different things. We can, we can mean the world to mean everybody. Sometimes we use it as an exaggeration. The Pharisees were complaining that the whole world was going after Jesus, but aren't they part of the world? <laughs> We also use the word in a limited way. We talk about Disney World. We talk about the world of science. What's Jesus mean? You know, if we look at Jesus' words elsewhere, it's pretty clear uh, Rob Bell is wrong. <laughs> Jesus does not save everyone. His salvation is yet not universal. Jesus says things like, I chose you out of the world... Or if the world hates you, know it hated me before it hated you. And think about what jo Jesus prayed for. In John 17, he says, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. See, the Holy Spirit has John use the word world to show how expanse and roomy God's love is. Because Nicodemus would have thought God's salvation is just for the Jews. And only for the Jews. And John uses the word world to, to shock the Jews. But what we learn from Scripture, too, is it's God's plan is also for the Gentiles, for people like us. For people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. For whoever and only those who believe in Jesus. All according to his plan. And I know we sometimes bring up then the question, and again, it's a sinful question. Well, why doesn't God save everyone? But really the question is, why did God save any of us? We were all perishing. We are all offensive to him. None of us deserve this grace, and yet it's because of his love any are saved. And while God knows who are his, he knows who are elect and we don't, it, uh, the purpose even of, of God speaking uh, later in other passages about God's election through the, through the Scripture is not for us to wrestle with, has God chosen me or not, but to accept what God promises, that all those that the Father has given me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Is to assure us of God's saving grace, His love. To sinners like us who do believe but still struggle. See, God's love is meant to assure us, encourage us, as frail, as sinful as we be. even as we strive to obey God out of thankfulness to Him. And that is part of, of our purpose as Christians. And we don't have to wonder, 
has God set his love on us? No, we're called to believe because the promise is whoever, whether you feel your sins are great or small, no matter what type of family you come from or what nation, whoever believes in him should not perish. See, faith reaches out like the hand of the beggar, uh, trying or uh, begging for that, even that last little morsel of bread. Faith looks up to Christ like the, the dying people did in the days of Moses, looking to, to the brazen serpent. They couldn't do anything but just look. And we look up to the crucified Christ, God's Son. Not because even that look somehow saves us, but it shows God is working in our hearts. Change our hearts to give us the heart of flesh, to believe His Word, and to receive His gift of grace by the cross and the righteousness of His Son. To be honest, there really is no better news than this. I mean, think about all the things that we're going to be eager to talk about at our Christmas dinners here in a couple days. But are we going to talk about this? We must. Are we talking about this in, in our conversations, in our daily life? And I know some people will get angry some don't want their, their, their sin uh, to come to light, to the light of day. They don't want to, they, they get angry at being called to repent and believe. But think of it this way, if somebody was sleeping while there was a fire, what would you do to wake that person up? You shake them, you yell at them. And yet we're not talking about a little fire but everlasting judgment where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. What if God's raised you up for that purpose? To plant the seed of the gospel or water the seed that somebody else has planted. We as Christians know there is hope found in the gracious love of God. And who knows if that person even is going to survive or live past that Christmas dinner or, or the time you see them. Because heaven or hell is always only a heartbeat away. Lastly, what is the benefit of God's love in Jesus? Well, it's everlasting life. It's, it's a growing relationship right now with God by faith. So that death while we're separated from our bodies, for anyone who believes in Christ, Christ promises us we'll not be separated from Him, from our triune God, but we'll live with Him forever. I know in this pluralistic society with this smorgasbord of religions all around us, we have to remember how precious, how amazing, how distinct this truth is of God's love that he gave his only begotten son to a world of sinners. Think about it. Every other religion is about what we do. In Islam, it's about what you do for Allah. And, and he may or may not be merciful. He's not loving. Millions of God of Hinduism. Not loving. And again, it's all about what you do. Whereas Christianity and God's Word reveals what God has sovereignly and mercifully done for sinners like us. And, and understand, if this morning you think, well, you know, one religion really is as good as another Understand, that's, that's an offense to God. That's a slap in His face. He gave His Son. And if we reject that, we reject salvation. God didn't have to make any way for salvation. He could have left us, as 1 Chronicles 29.15 says, spend our days on earth as a shadow and without hope. But here is the good news. You have in your hands. How many Bibles do we have in our home? We got them on our phones now. But we have in our hands the opposing view of this perishing world. The only sure promise of a sure hope from God himself. And his infallible word. And the promise that God intervenes and he acts. 
He changes hearts and even the directions of our life and gives eternal life when we ask. Have you asked for it? And if you do, and if you believe in the Lord, the promise is He works in us both to will and to do His good pleasure. So it's all according to His plan, and it's all part of His gift of His love received by faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, four years and two kids after a young man and woman got married, and I've heard this story a few times here, and I don't encourage you following this, but the wife explained that she didn't know why, but standing before a pile of dishes and a pile of diapers in the corner, she sinfully walked out on her family. Later that night, she called and asked how the kids were. Her husband replied, well, they're fed and they're clothed. When are you coming home? She hung up. This happened over and over across many, many weeks. And, and, and then the husband's pleas even were, we love you and we want you to come back. Where are you? Click. He emptied his savings and, and hired a private detective and thankfully found his wife was staying at a cheap motel. And so he got out on a plane and flew there and he knocked on the door. And when she came to the door, he said, we love you. Will you come home. And she fell into his arms and wept and went home. Months later, he worked up the courage to ask her, why didn't you come home the first time we asked you? We told you we loved you. She said before, they were only words. And then you came. And God's words should be more than good enough for us. He's given us many promises. But they're not just words of his love because Jesus came for sinners like me and like you. The Father gave the Son to enter this world to live a perfectly pleasing life to God that you and I cannot. To die an atoning death that we could not. And the reason is shocking. We all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you believed in Him? Have you repented? If you have, you will not perish in hell. Are you trying to encourage others to believe this truth as well, this only hope? The world is perishing. They need to hear it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you message is so clear and yet too familiar sometimes. We thank you for this truth, for, for you made him, God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You tell us even, for Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And you've done that all out of your love. We don't even understand, frankly, what, what love is. We think of it as a warm emotion, fuzzy feeling. And yet you show love is an undeserving sacrifice of your son. We come before you because so many don't have the ears to hear and we didn't have the ears to hear at first either until you worked in our hearts but we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would speak to those who are still in darkness. I pray that there would be no person here who would think they're too young or too old or too smart or, or not so smart. Give them a childlike faith. Strengthen us who believe so that we would still rest on that amazing love and grace and continue to repent and believe and follow you. Strengthen us in this so that you would receive all the glory and wisdom and honor that you deserve, Lord, for such a great salvation. We give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.